say amen today. Amen. 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 The song uh, that we are going to read today is Psalm 145. And we are going to read verse 8 through 21. song, and really all it does is extol the Lord uh, for his goodness uh, towards us. Boy, I woke up this morning and it says, where is the Lord warming when you need it? Amen? Amen. I don't know why, but I guess it don't make no difference whether I'm not ready for it or not. It's here. Yes, sir. And so, uh, 70, 70 on Friday. And it's no good day. So, amen. Yeah. Got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. Uh, but we are really blessed. And uh, it's good to be here today. Uh, good to see all of you. And um, uh, whether we know it or not, we are truly blessed yeah. of the Lord greatly. And so before we read this song, uh, we just need to be remindful that um, there's still so much to pray about. Amen. Um, we need to pray about uh, most importantly the salvation for those who, who do not know the Lord. And uh, I want to encourage you when the Lord opens up an opportunity uh, for you to witness a witness. Yes. And so many times we think that um, the effectiveness of us witness to someone, it depends upon us, it depends upon how we say it, uh, it depends upon whether we are clever, uh, it really depends upon the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he is the one who convicts of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. It's our responsibility to give people the gospel, and uh, you know, we give it to them in love, um, what's stated very plainly. Uh, Unless you know Christ is saved, you are separated from God now. And you'll be separated from God throughout eternity. And I think people need to know that Jesus said it was an eternity of torment. <coughs> Out of darkness. We live, in a, we live in a day which people, they want to be made to feel good. And we don't want to hear the truth. If it doesn't make us, if it makes us feel bad, I don't know if we're, we're into the feeling. We're into the feeling here of our culture. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel. I don't feel safe. I don't feel that you love me. But do you know that? No, that's not important. I just don't feel it. Uh, we're into the feel thing, apart from any objective facts. But people need to know that um, you can leave here any time. And wherever death finds you, that's where eternity will keep you. And there's only one way to be saved, and his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We'll read that this morning. He said, no man can come to the Father, no man can come to God except through me. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us. And uh, always remember, the gospel very simple. Jesus died for us on the cross. He was buried. He rose bodily from the dead on the third day. And faith is by trusting and this Jesus, who gave himself for us, who completely paid up the debt of our sin, past sin, present sin, and future sin, and God has promised to save us entirely or forever if we trust in his Son alone for the salvation of our souls. And so, you know, all of us need to be equipped to at least give people that message of hope. Amen? amen. And amen. We need to pray for our country. Whether you know it or not, we're really in trouble. But we're not, we're not in trouble for the reason most think. Amen. Uh, we're in trouble because of our sin. Amen. And uh, that has a much more greater consequence than whoever was elected. We are in trouble because of our sin. Amen. And uh, as I said before, I, I lay most of the blame for this on Christians. Because we have not uh, been the salt of the earth that Jesus said we were to be. So pray for our country, pray for our land. Uh, some of our sick, uh, Deacon Scott serving, 
uh, next week, let us pray for him. Yes. Uh, other sick, uh, not here today, Sister Ramona not feeling well, others not feeling well. Uh, so let us pray one for the other. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's read this song, it's number 145, 8 through 21. It really extolled the Lord for his goodness unto us. Let's read it starting in verse 8. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All of your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts in the glory and majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall and brings us all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hands and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's really a, it's a, it's a deep song. Amen. And it really is addresses every need that we have in life. Uh, all of us need uh, the Lord to be gracious and slow to anger. All of us need the Lord to be good. All of us need the Lord to sustain us. And uh, we need to praise Him for these things. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. So we remain standing for our responsibility this morning. We've got the center of the bulletin. First of all, we 1629. I will read the odd verses. We will read it even, and we will read verse 29 together. Sing to the Lord, all the earth will claim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 29 together. Ascribe to the Lord the glory with his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in holy array. You may be seated.
Psalm, from Psalm 100 and verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise.
1 through 6 this morning. A familiar passage that we are going to get it from another angle as we continue to study God. John 14, 1 through 6. I'm going to begin reading that one and uh, read through 5, and you can respond by reading verse 6. Back to me. <clears throat> Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Yes. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Tom said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Verse 6, read. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And God's people say amen. Amen. Service away from ending this series. That is this morning sermon and next Sunday sermon. And then we will begin to preach and teach on Jesus' view of the scriptures and what Jesus believed to be true concerning the written word of God. Uh, I might do a couple of uh, sermons uh, that are favorites to me before that, but our next uh, elongated series, we're going to study what Jesus thought about the scripture, the written word of God. But for this morning, I want to continue on our study of God once again in this series. When I'm talking about, or when I speak about knowing God, I'm not speaking of knowing God in the sense of salvation through a personal relationship with Christ through faith in the gospel. For the fact that Jesus died for sin on the cross according to the scriptures was buried and rose from the dead according to the scriptures on the third day. Now I want all to understand that knowing God in the salvation sense, genuine repentance and faith in Christ it is the most important aspect of knowing God. Yes. One necessarily proceed, proceeds or precedes the other. You have to know God to know God. Yes. You have to know God to know God. Amen. You have to know God to know God better. Amen. And so I want you to understand because I know how people think They'll leave her and say, Pastor Kendall says, salvation is not important. That's not true. That is the thing. But I'm talking about knowing God in our minds according to the knowledge we discover in the Word of God. That we discover by looking in the Word of God and studying the person of Christ. And also, but to a lesser extent, the knowledge that God has revealed in himself in his creation or in his nature. Romans says, you know, the invisible things of God are clearly understood by the things that God has made. So we can have uh, some, some understanding of God through creation, but we need to really study what God has revealed in himself in his word and most importantly, what is revealed of himself through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And as we have been studying all that we can possibly study about God in this short period of time, we have seen that God is a spiritual being as opposed to a physical being. God is spirit. It is his essence and substance. God is a masculine being. God is not an impersonal force, but he is a self-conscious self-determining being. God is conscious of himself. God makes choices to bring about various outcomes. God is self-conscious and God is self-determining. 
God is life. He just doesn't give life. God is life. And apart from God, there is no life whatsoever. God is self-existent, or he is the uncaused cause of all things. No one created God. God simply is. God is a complex being, for he is one being who eternally subsists or abides. In three distinct eternal persons revealed in the scriptures as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so these three persons are the true and living God. These three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they equally share one and the same essence, one and the same substance, one and the same nature, one and the same power, one and the same attributes of God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have internal relationship with one another. There is an order of submission between these three persons. And there are distinct roles in the activity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet none is ever detached from what the other does. It's kind of, it's almost like we call it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradox. It seems to contradict, but it's true. Um, you know, Jesus said, uh, destroy this body, and in three days, I will raise it. But we also read that the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead, and the Father raised the Lord from... So you see, Jesus was the person of the Trinity that rose from the dead. That's the state. Mm -hmm. But he was raised by his power, the same power shared by the Father in the Spirit of God. State and role, but equal in power. Never, the, the substance is never divided, the essence is, is never divided. One eternal substance and nature of God. Now, to deny this aspect of the doctrine of God, it is really the practice of idolatry. And I say this because most groups deny the triunity of God or the fact that there is just one God who eternally subsists in three distinct persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit have made God to reflect the image of man rather than man reflecting the image of God. So the problem is we think God mirrors us. Amen. I am one person. One being. And so we tend to think God reflects us. Nope. That's not true. We reflect God. Amen. But God is much more complex than us. Amen. Remember that. You know, the, the, the object is always greater than its reflection. Amen. You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you know, you can you can see some of what you're like, but not all of it. You know, you can't see your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, but you can see some things about you in, in your reflection in the mirror. But you are greater than your reflection. Amen. We reflect God, but we as a reflection are not greater than God. Amen. Amen. God is complex. Amen. He is one. He is one being, one God who is three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to deny that is the practice of idolatry because you have made God to be like man and it's just not so. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I pray that you always remember that. If you notice it in each one of these sermons, that's where I spend the most time, right there. Because that's the most important thing Amen. out of everything that we're studying about God, who God is. He is one God, but three distinct eternal persons. So to deny the Trinity is idolatry. Amen. And so this is why the doctrine of the Trinity is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Apart from which, man's only option is to practice idolatry and look at, look at God as he looks upon himself. In, review of, in, in view of all of this, uh, religions and cults such as Islam and the Jehovah's Witness and 
Going all the way this morning, oneness apostolic Pentecostals. They are practicing idolatry by denying the fact that God is a complex being who eternally subsists in three distinct persons revealed in the scriptures as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I will go on to say to join forces with any of these proceed any of those preceding groups in ministry of worship is to join forces with idolaters. Amen. Amen. Get a few things. <laughs> Come on, dig deep this morning. I mean, Come on. We shouldn't be singing songs of glory with, I'm just keeping it real today. We should not be singing the praise of God with the oneness, modalists. Amen. Amen. The apostolic. And, and, and remember, that's not all Pentecostals. Right. Oneness, apostolics. They are practicing idolatry. Amen. So we shouldn't be worshiping with them because they are practicing idolatry. Praise Amen. God. Come on, teach. Just a few, just a few. Amen. Come on, teach. You, you, Dig deep this morning. Amen. And, and you know, every time God's people got in the company of idolatry, they always got in trouble. Amen. And, this, and, and that's what, what said, you know, uh, you know, Balaam. Mm -hmm. Adam sitting up there, just watch, just watch the pagans eat dinner. That's all you got to do. Watch how we eat our food. And the disease and rot spread all throughout the camp. And it was so bad until God tells Moses sometime before, you're not going to see the promised land because, you, you know, you smoked the rock twice. So you're not going. I'm going to let you see it. God let him see it. But he said, I'll tell you what, before I take you, I got one mission. Kill one Balaam. last thing for you to do. Kill Balaam. Kill Balaam. Amen. Cut him down. Idolatry. Amen. And so we can't be saying great is thy faithfulness with those who deny the single doctrine for the triunity of God because they are practicing idolatry. T.D. Jakes is an idolater. Amen. Amen. Because he has made God to reflect him rather than us reflecting God Amen. but never being as great and complex Amen. as the object. Amen. That's God who we reflect. Amen. Not to be all think I'm wasting a lot of time, but I'm really not. Amen. See, this is now that is essential to being saved. Amen. Right? Salvation. God is immutable. God does not change. God is immense. No created space can contain him. Amen. God's presence is too big for the universe. To contain his presence, for his presence is infinite. God is eternal in relationship to time and space. God has no beginning. He has no end. God simply serum or the liquid part of the blood, the clear part of the blood known as plasma. <coughs> then two secret followers of the Lord and Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus' body down from the cross. They wrapped it in about 75 pounds of spices, aloe, and myrrh. The, the reality which the, the reality which corresponds to that is what Jesus was dead. That's the truth. It explains something real. Or consider this: Jesus' physical body was literally dead. There was no life in one cell in his body. However, on the third day after his death, there was a massive earthquake. The Roman soldiers who were guarding the tomb needed to protect his body from being stolen said a strange being that looked like light appeared, picked up the large circular stone that had sealed the Lord's tomb and carried it away from some distance, sat on it, and looked at it. <laughs> the guards were overwhelmed with fear, and they ran and ran to the, and they ran to report this to the Jewish officials. After this, some women who had went to Jesus' tomb to finish anointing his body for burial reported that an angel told them Jesus had bodily been raised from the dead. And they were going to tell the disciples this great news. And as they went back to report this to the Jesus disciples, the Lord met them, and they actually touched his body by taking hold of his feet. The women told the disciples these things, but they thought they were a bunch of hysterical women who were suffering from some form of delusion. Nevertheless, Peter and John, they still run to the tomb. They look inside, and they see the grave clothes that have been wrapped around the Lord and, and, and encased with this, with these of aloe and myrrh and, 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 and the grave cloth that covered him was still in a mummy human form, but it was empty, and the napkin that had placed over his head was folded neatly and in another place in the tomb. Later that day, two disciples on the man's road ran to a man, and he gave one of the best Bible studies they ever participated in. Amen. And they didn't know 
floor was him until he sat down to break bread. When he broke the bread, they immediately realized he was Jesus, and they said he vanished from our sight. As the two disciples were telling the rest of the disciples this story, the Bible says Jesus appeared in the midst and told them, Touch me, touch my hands and my feet, and see that it is indeed I. He then eats a piece of broiled fish that had been placed before him. It was at this time the Lord also gave them a holy tongue lashing for not believing he would rise from the dead. The corresponding truth of that is what? Jesus rose yeah. from the dead. Yeah. That's truth. In view of this, the definite, in view of this definition of truth, <clears throat> when Jesus says, I am the truth, what he's saying is this. He's saying, I am the sum total of everything that corresponds to reality. Amen. He says, everything that is factual, everything that is true, I am the sum total of that. Yeah. What he's saying is, it would not be there except for me. Mm -hmm. That truth would not be there unless the truth made it so. Yes. Yes. We must also remember that God is a complex being. He is one God and eternally subsists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three persons who are one and true, who are the one and true living God, they share one and the same everything. And so when Jesus says, I am the truth, the same is true of the Father and the spirit. God is true. God is the sum total of all that corresponds to reality. Yes, yes. Everything that is factual and true, God is the corresponding reality to that. Amen. In other words, God is the truth. Yes. The essential nature of God is the truth upon which all truth exists. The essential nature of God is true. Therefore, everything else that is true, it rests upon him because he is the truth. God is the standard by which all things which are true are verified to be true or false. God is the standard who reveals what is true and what is false. It is because of this we can actually state the following. Everything which is true in the universe <coughs> is founded upon the nature of God. Yeah. But God is the truth in the ultimate sense. He is all which corresponds to reality. But that which is real and that which truly exists. Everything that is true, it flows from God, essential nature. Mm -hmm. See, we got stuff out here that is true, but it comes from the truth. <laughs> Are you with me today? Okay. Therefore, the number one ingredient to knowing the truth is to know the one from whom yes. all truth yes. flows. Yes. 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 If you don't know God who is truth, you can never know what is genuinely and necessarily true. Amen. That's why we need to know God. Amen. Yes, yes. I hope you notice that knowledge and knowing, there's really three ingredients to knowing. There's three things. Three ingredients to knowing. You must know, you must understand, and then receive it. Amen. If all three of those factors are not there, it's not true. Yes. You must know, you must understand, and receive. You see, if one knows and understands but doesn't receive, they really don't believe it is true. You know what I mean in an example? Come on, teach. I have one. If I tell you squirrel is delicious, and you prepare right, you gotta soak it overnight in some salt water. Mm -hmm. Cut it up just like a piece, just like a chicken. You season it with salt, pepper, a little bit of powdered garlic. Mm -hmm. Then you make your batter. Don't use flour, get you some cornstarch. Bacon powder and buttermilk. 
Put that squirrel in there and let them soak in there That's right. for a couple hours. Then get you some peanut oil and heat it to the same degree that you were going to fry one of the nastiest animals in the world, a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> then you fry it on each side until it is crispy. Then you set the oven at about 215 degrees and cover it up and just let it sit in there for about three hours. Get you a bottle of hot sauce and get down. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may know what I said, you understand what I said, but if you refuse to eat <laughs> the back leg of that squirrel, you don't really believe what I just said. <laughs> Y'all understand? Yeah. So you must know, you must understand and receive. Yeah. That's true. The same can be said concerning all oh, which is true. Y'all laughing, the squirrel is good. <laughs> Y'all laughing, I'm telling you. If I fix it, it's good. I had to shoo my away from my squirrel one day. <laughs> she just smacked me. That's good, Daddy. I know it's good. <laughs> we can't persuade Sister Kimball anyway. <laughs> Moises Silver. 
And the person who, or one of the authors of this book, he recounted an experience he had when he was studying for his doctoral degree. And let me just read it to you. I'm almost done. And he says this. He's talking about the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit in understanding the Word of God. So let me just read it to you. One of the key texts that must be considered here is the pivotal statement of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. He says, while working on my doctoral program, a most unusual experience took place in one of the seminars I attended that rapidly sealed this text on my heart and mind. A distinguished professor, recently retired from Yale University, was offering a special seminar entitled Origins of Christianity at the university I was attending on the East Coast. One day the class sidetracked the professor into discussing his understanding about on the meaning of Romans 1 through 5. With unusual eloquence and masterful exegesis, he walked through these chapters with a precise deafness affirming that everyone in the class had sinned and therefore had come short of the glory of God. But for those who would believe in God's sacrifice of his son for their sins, they would not just be made righteous, no, they would be declared righteous by God who justified sinners, much as a judge did who dismissed the case that had failed to prove his defendant guilty. He said, rarely have I ever heard such a bold and fair treatment of this text of Paul. After two hours, however, the spell was suddenly broken when one of the Jewish students in the class who, along with many others, had sat uncomfortably through this long and to them seemingly parochial tirade, <laughs> blurted out amidst all the nervous smoking that was going on in the seminar. He said, do I get the impression that the professor of this class believes this stuff? Immediately, the professor responded in a scoffing tone. Who said anything about believing it? I am just arguing that this is what Paul said. I'm sick and tired of hearing the younger neo-Orthodox scholars say this is what this or that text means to me. He says, I was trained under the liberal theology. We learn what Paul said. We just don't happen to believe what Paul said. <laughs> the reason the scholar couldn't get it, the reason he didn't understand Paul's word of truth because he did not know the one who is the truth. <laughs> He could not know this necessary truth because he did not know the one wow. who was true. Amen. I'm going to say this and I'm going to sit down. Strange but nevertheless true. I have and I am encountering many who claim to know Christ as Savior. The one who claim he is the truth. But they seem not to be able to know, understand, or receive necessary Biblical truth. I hear those who claim to just love them to Jesus and are full of the Holy Ghost and fire. <laughs> but seem to be unable to know, understand, and any more importantly, receive necessary truth from the Word of God. I can understand Christians struggling with truth in relation to a gray area. Something that the scriptures do not clearly address. You know, Paul talks about those things in Romans, there are gray areas. He says, if you can't do it in faith, don't do it, but somebody else can because it's not a problem. Then there are gray areas Amen. in life. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mess with chillers. <laughs> Poor fellow. I can't eat them in faith. <laughs> so to me, it's sin. Amen. Now, if you want to eat them things, go ahead and get down. I ain't I ain't no
But I do not understand Christians not having a clue in regard to necessary truth. Which I really believe is very clear in the scriptures. For a truth you don't need to be a theologian to comprehend. See, if you know the one who is the truth, you should be able to grasp this truth when it's said before you. And even importantly, you should be able to receive it. Amen. Amen. I really go try to bring this subject up because it exasperates me when I discuss it with Christians. Come on. Or teach. many Christians. Teach. But it's the subject of abortion or ending the life of those who have not yet been born. And I use it because more than any other I can think of, it stresses the point that some things that are really clear in the Bible, many Christians seem not to be able to get it. And I'm wondering, how, how, how can that be when you say you know the one who is the truth? If you know the one who is the truth, you should be able to stand what is true. Many Christians cannot grasp the fact that abortion is murder. I know many think that's too harsh of a term to define what abortion is. But the last time I read the scriptures, premeditated, the premeditated, to the premeditated of a human life is murder. Amen. See, we, we are an Isaiah 30, 10 crowd. Amen. What is that? They told Isaiah, you must not prophesy to us what is, you must not prophesy to us what is right. <laughs> speak to us pleasant things. King James says, speak to us smooth things. <laughs> Pleasing to me. It's that prophesy illusions to us. <laughs> Don't tell us anything harsh. No, you oh, tell us. Don't tell us right stuff. We want relevant preaching. Smooth. <laughs> See, that's who we are. It's murder. Amen. You can read that Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you, God, for my inward parts, you woke me in my mother's womb. The text states the truth that is the hand of God which is working. Amen. And that unborn child in the womb, making it develop and grow. God. It also reveals while, the womb, while in the womb, the unborn child is a person, for it says, my mother. Amen. When you were in the womb, you were in the womb of your mother. Amen. Not only persons have mothers. Amen. Amen. Am I in the house today? Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach. And also, the personal pronouns are used to describe it in the morning. When I was yet in my mother's womb, that's... Come on, teach. But yet Christians cannot seem to see in this verse that the unborn are real human beings who have a right to be born and live. Amen. You can read in Luke 1 15, which says John the Baptist, full of the Holy Spirit, while yet in his mother's womb. The text says he'll be great in the eyes of the Lord, he will drink no, no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Wow. Fetal tissue cannot be Holy Spirit filled. Amen. Amen. Come on, tissues are. Yes. When Mary began to sing that song of praise, the Bible says Elite. John the Baptist, while yet in the visit of womb, he leaped for joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Brother John, amen. Move. Now, if you can read that and still not grasp to that this is a person who has a right to live, but claim to know the one who is the truth, somebody's getting it wrong. Yeah. And I don't Thank believe you, it is God. Amen. I got in a discussion with this with a brother the other day. He says he's a brother of the Lord. And I said, well, you know, I said, you know, in the Old Testament, the Jews fell into the idolatry of the worship of Moloch. And I said, they would take their babies eight days old after being born. And this big bronze statue of Moloch had outstretched hands big enough to hold a child, and they would start firing the belly of this statue. And it would get so hot that the hands would become white hot. And they would put that little baby up there and fry him to death, sacrificing this God named Moloch. And you know what he told me? That was in the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. 
Mm. Blasphemous. So I guess in his mind, if it's in the Old Testament, that's when it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But now it's okay. And he tried to press me. That was in the Old Testament. So you mean killing babies were wrong in the old, but now it's cool? <laughs> he looked at me like a deer in the headlights. I use it because in my thinking, if a person truly knows the God was the truth, you should be able to understand this very simple thing. Amen. The killing babies is big time sin. Amen. See, that's a necessary truth you need to know. You need to necessarily know you don't kill your babies. Amen. You let them live. Like you had the opportunity to live. And ain't none of y'all trying to get out of here, are you? You're trying to stay as long as you can. Why? That's your fault. No. These babies want to live like you. The same is true with all necessary truth. In order to know what is necessary truth, you cannot separate it from really knowing the God who is truth. Therefore, for us to understand, know, understand, and receive truth, we must find out as much as we can about God to know him because he is the truth. Right. Upon which all of the truth stands are fall. Amen. 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 I'm going to shut it down. Let's pray. Amen. 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 And we believe all that it states is the truth. <clears throat> Lord, we want to know you better. In order that we might better know what is the truth. Lord, we want to know you better. To distinguish between what is true and what is false. Lord, help us to understand and never forget that your essential nature is the truth. And everything that is really true, it is rooted and grounded, and it is founded upon you. Therefore, Lord, we need to know you all the better. In order to know all the better, that which is true. And so, Lord, lead us and guide us. Lord, let us grasp and gain a deeper understanding of who you are and what you have done. And you, who you are, must be praised in Jesus' name. If there is one day you are not saved, you do not know Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness at the cross. We all have an ugly sin issue. Nobody is exempt. It's a sin issue so ugly that the only one who could remedy it was Jesus. And he did that on the cross. He bore our sins in his body, all of them past, present, and future, was nailed to the cross. He suffered your just penalty for your sin. And you can be saved by asking him to come into your life. God will forgive you of every sin. If there is one today, would you just raise your hand? We pray for those in this church and also out there in YouTube land, live stream you might have accidentally ran into this uh, broadcast and, and wanted to see what this fanatic is talking about and you realize that you have a serious sin issue that separates you from god tell god you're sorry for your sinful disgusting life believe in his son that he died for your sins was buried and rose again and god promises that you put faith in that gospel that you will save your soul forever. And so, Lord, we pray this in Jesus Christ's name today. Lord, there are many prayer needs, many things that we need to pray about once again. Uh, pray for Deacon Scott, surgery yes. next week. Uh, others uh, that need a job breakthrough. Others 
other physical infirmities, Lord, you know what we all need. Father God, lead us and guide us in the right path of you. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. May God be us. Amen. 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 We're going to ask the men to come. Amen. Come down to the Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give of our financial gifts. Lord, bless those who give. Bless those who want to give but don't have. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.